Welcome to Within the Frame, where we bring today's most pressing issues into focus. I'm Kim Mogen. Today is election day, where Americans head to the polls to vote for their next president. The race to elect the 47th president of the United States kicked off hours ago in New Hampshire, and more polls are opening across the country. Both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris need a minimum of 270 electoral votes to secure the presidency, with key battleground states Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin playing a crucial role in determining the winner. Now, with the stakes higher than ever, the world is watching closely to see whether Democratic candidate and current Vice President Kamala Harris will make history as the first female president, or if former Republican President Donald Trump will stage an unprecedented comeback to claim a second term. For the latest on the election situation, we first connect to our Voice of America correspondent, Jessica Stone in Virginia. Thanks for coming on, Jessica. You bet. It's good to be here. So, Jessica, uh, election day has finally come. It's 8.30 p.m. here in South Korea, and I believe it's around uh, very early hours of 6.30 or a.m. in Virginia. I believe polls have opened by now. How's the local atmosphere shaping up? Well, I got to tell you, um, we have been here since 3 a.m. local time, and it is now 6.30 local time. And right when the polls opened here in Arlington, Virginia, we saw about 60 people walk right in the door, li lined all up. And you can still see uh, even more people in the distance uh, behind that glass door. So there is definitely a lot of enthusiasm here, which is something that the uh, person in charge of the polling location was a little bit surprised at, actually, uh, because there was also a big response here to early voting. I st stood in line on uh, Friday for about 20 or 30 minutes uh, outside the polling location before even getting in just to finish early voting. And we know that about 2 million early votes took place here just in the state of Virginia, uh, close to 80 million nationwide. Here in Virginia, that's about a third of the registered vote. It is less than the 2020 early vote. That is nationwide also the case, about half as many Americans voted early as voted in 2020. Of course, those pandemic restrictions being a huge part of that. Um, but the uh, the Harris campaign leads by almost six points here in Virginia. So even though this is kind of on the border of being a swing state, it's not a critical swing state. It's certainly not a predictor of the outcome uh, of this election in terms of turnout or uh, the polling location or the polling uh, data. And so we haven't really seen a lot of time spent by the candidates here in the last few hours and days of the campaign. Right. So it's good to hear that a lot of people were eager to vote from the beginning of the, when the polling stations have opened. And both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump have ramped up their campaigns up to the final uh, weekend. Do we know where the candidates are right now and um, what's the mood like in their camps? Well, these candidates uh, spent a lot of time in the critical swing state of Pennsylvania uh, in the last hours of the campaign. Kamala Harris and her campaign crisscrossing the states from Pittsburgh on the west to uh, Philadelphia in the east, ending the day on those uh, very iconic rocky steps in the city of brotherly love. Uh, she uh, spent virtually the whole day in Pennsylvania, but started it in Michigan, another battleground state. And then Trump, for his part, started in Raleigh, North Carolina, shoring up that vote in North Carolina, uh, which he really needs to win. Uh, he won it by less than a percentage point four years ago, been spending two more stops in Pennsylvania and, and finishing the day in Michigan, uh, which is tight for him. It's, it's not terribly likely that he's going to win Michigan, but we'll have to see how the turnout goes. He ended the day in the western part of the state, Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is a more conservative leaning part of the state. Uh, and um, both of these camps are now uh, back in their respective locations, uh, the Trump campaign back in Florida and uh, the Harris campaign. Uh, back in uh, the D.C. area. But uh, <clears throat> in terms of the mood of these campaigns, you know, it's it's been so tight that they are literally watching not only the public polling, which we see, but the internal polling that they get uh, about the results. And so uh, there's definitely the feeling of excitement and concern uh, and great attention to these results as we go forward. Right. So these candidates have been um, exerting their best efforts up to the last minute. Now, Jessica, how does the latest election compare to four years ago? What do you think about the level of public interest this time around? 
There is definitely uh, a lot of enthusiasm and attention uh, to the election. And we saw that in part, even though the early voting numbers weren't as great as they were 20 year, uh, excuse me, four years ago and in 2020, uh, part of that can be explained again by those restrictions. We did see a surge in, in rural voting and in Republican early voting. That's largely attributed to the fact that the Republican uh, side of the aisle really uh, encouraged their voters to get out early. Uh, and four years ago, Donald Trump's message was don't get out early, you, early, you can't trust that vote, you can't trust that process. This time they did a 180, they turned right around and suggested that their voters get out early. And so we are seeing an early lead in the early voting for Republicans in the battleground states. Um, there is also uh, some fear on the part of Democrats that, that there will be, uh, you know, four years ago we sort of had the blue mirage where we had a lead on the Democrats going into Election Day. Uh, now th that pr is unlikely to be the case because we have so many early votes from the Republicans. So uh, Obama's former campaign manager, Jim Messina, over the weekend said that it is a little bit scary for the Harris campaign because they're going into this without a lead in the early voting. But again, just to clarify uh, how many rules have changed about how we count this vote, this election cycle. Cycle. There's been a lot of changes since four years ago. There are three swing states that are not going to start counting or processing ballots until this morning. Right. So it's going to be a very tight race until the very last minute. Uh, the back in 2020, Jessica, Joe Biden took four days to declare victory, largely due to delays in counting ballots in Pennsylvania. What about this time around? When can we expect some clarity on this results? So the reason I'm talking so much about when the count and when the processing begins is really because that is going to give us some prediction of how long it's going to take. In Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Georgia, they do not begin the counting until the polls open of the early vote. So uh, states like Arizona, uh, uh, other states, uh, they have been uh, in Michigan, they have been they have already been counting ahead of time which means once the polls open, they already have the early vote processed and counted. Processing, by the way, literally means opening the envelope of a mail-in or an absentee ballot, checking that the registration is legitimate even before you count. So that's an extra layer of the process. Because that is starting late in three critical swing states uh, or later than the other critical swing states, it stands to reason that it could be some days, potentially four days or more before we have an election result because this is a close election, 48% to 48% between Harris and Trump as we go into the uh, last polling data from the New York Times Siena College poll. This is neck and neck and uh, turnout is going to be key and accuracy is going to be key. And you can bet that there's going to be a court challenge or two along the way if there are any issues or concerns about the validity of voters, voter registrations, uh, or any of the counting methodologies that are used today. All right, uh, Jessica, thank you so much for the updates. We'll connect with you again on Wednesday for more details. You bet. Good to be with you. And now to help us break down the key issues, forecast possible outcomes, and provide a global perspective on what this election could mean for the international community, we are joined in the studio by Min Jung-un, professor at the Korean National Diplomatic Academy. Professor Min, thank you for coming in. Good evening. So, Professor, this election has seen a surge in early voting, like our uh, Jessica mentioned, uh, with over 80 million ballots already being cast. While early voting rates are lower than COVID times, it's still higher than 2016 and 2012, the prior elections. What is driving this increase? And could we still see this high early votes could be of advantage to the Democratic candidate? Yes, as, uh, as Jessica mentioned, over 80 million voters already cast the ballots uh, by early voting, and uh, which means that more than half of the voters uh, voted through early voting this year. So I think the for I think that uh, for the outcome of the election, it would be very important which party supporters cast their ballots by early voting more than the other party supporters like the, their uh, counterparts. Um, as you mentioned, uh, and the four years ago, in terms of the COVID-19 restrictions, more than 100 million voters uh, cast their ballots by early voting. And in the past, um, the, the early voting rates, rate was high among Democratic Party supporters, but this could be uh, could not be the case uh, uh, this year because the, the Republican Party, uh, they, the, the Trump camp uh, 
uh, strongly encouraged their supporters to come out to vote early because they realize that the early voting is very important uh, for the uh, result of the election. So, um, and there's, I think that the Republican Party supporters re responded to the call from the, the Trump camp. So there is a report that uh, in some states, uh, in terms of the early, vo the early voting, there, seem, there seems to be little difference in the ratio of uh, Democratic and Republican Party supporters uh, among early voting participants. Uh, specifically, the outcome of the early voting in 26 states show that the party affiliation of early uh, voting participants was 37.9% for the Democratic Party and 36% for the Republican Party. So, which means that just the 1.9% difference between the two party uh, supporters. Um, so, I think that um, the, advan the, the advantage that the Democratic Party has got in terms of uh, early voting rate uh, seems to be smaller uh, this year, but still, the early voting favors the Democratic Party. And the actual outcome of the early voting this year, we'll, we will see the actual result when the, the ballot boxes are opened. Right, of course, um, but we still see a slight uh, one point something percent for, uh, mm. for the Democratic Party's advantage. Now, uh, Professor, as we sp were speaking, voters are heading to the polling stations in America. Uh, when do exit polls actually get uh, released and how much do you think they could help us predict the winner? Well, um, as you know, the, the America has got the four different you know, time zones. And uh, in terms of different time zones, uh, the, they have the different the, the, uh, the poll, polling closing times uh, in terms of the, the, the eastern and the Midwest and the west or something like that. And interestingly, unlike, <coughs> excuse me, unlike South Korea, uh, in the United States, people don't care about uh, that kind of a different uh, closing time and the, when the exit polls will be revealed to the public because the, the right after each time zone finishes their vote, they, the CNN and other the, the, uh, U.S. The media just the, the broadcast the, the results of the, the exit polls to the public. So, for example, when the, the, uh, the voting is closed in the uh, uh, east state, eastern state, east, east coast, east coast state, then the, the, uh, the U.S. the media just broadcast which candidates uh, could be win by the uh, kind of the which which margin of vote. Uh, or the, it's like a live broadcast, but the still other parts of the United States still voting are ongoing. So it's very interesting, but they don't care about that. <laughs> so anyway, um, the exit polls uh, show the accuracy in the past elections, but uh, this year we got the higher rates of the early voting, so it would not be easy to grab the, the early voting participants, the, the voter choices uh, through the exit polls. So there are the pros and cons about the accuracy of the exit polls this, this time. So we will see whether the exit polls, the, the projection would be uh, uh, going well with the actual election outcome. So that would be the, another challenge that the polling the companies uh, have been facing. Right. Now, Professor, uh, we've, we've talked about this just a while ago. Um, both candidates have been uh, continuing their campaigns up to the last minute. But um, alongside Pennsylvania, uh, both Trump and Harris have also focused on North Carolina, mm -hmm. which is also seen as a key battleground. Why are analysts now uh, seeing North Carolina as a crucial late, late ground uh, battleground? It, it, may, it is mainly the dependent on the, the voter calculation among the, the seven battleground states. 
As you know, there are seven battleground states uh, in this election. Among them, there are three Rust Belt uh, the battleground states like Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and the four Sun Belt states, including North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. And uh, on average, in terms of the uh, polling results, it seems that Harris is leading the polls for the three Rust Belt states, while and three the Rust Belt states in Nevada, and the Trump is ahead in the polls for the remaining three Sun Belt states. So in order to win the election, each candidate needs to receive 270 the college votes, and except the uh, seven battleground states, Harris is expected to receive 226 college votes, and while Trump is expected to get 219 college votes among the safe state, safer states. Uh, then if we suppose that Harris uh, uh, wins the four states, the three the Rust Belt states and Nevada, then she will receive 276. And while Trump, 262. Then Harris uh, will win the election. But suppose that Trump wins the three Sun Belt states and Pennsylvania, uh, then, and then he will get 281 college votes. Then he will, he will win. So Pennsylvania is still the most important state for Harris' the victory. But if she loses in Pennsylvania and he, she still needed to win the election, then she needed to make up the loss uh, from another state. And so suppose that if Harris wins Wisconsin, Michigan and Nevada, and she will get 256, 257 college votes. It means that she needed to get 13 more right. college votes to win the election. Then she needed to win North Carolina or Georgia, which the each state has got 16 electoral college votes, respectively. And the recent polls show that Harris shows a better performance in North Carolina than Georgia. Mm -hmm. So I think the experts consider North Carolina as a crucial last came better ground state in vote for calculation for the election victory. Pennsylvania first yeah. and North Carolina. Right. Thank you so much for the clear <laughs> explanation and calculation, <laughs> Professor. Now, Professor, uh, one of the key factors in voting preferences of white women are mm. very important at this time. We, hear, we have been hearing of the term shy Trump in the past, but can you explain to us about the background of hidden Harris and mm. shy Trump votes? How significant would they be? Well, um, as you know, we got the shy Trump from the 2016 uh, presidential election. At the time, um, some Republican Party supporters uh, uh, weren't sure if it would be acceptable to publicly express that they supported Trump. Uh, it's mainly because, as you know, Trump was not, uh, was not one of the typical the presidential candidates, uh, Republican candidates who was fit for the uh, Republican Party's presidential nominee. So they were reluctant. They were reluctant to expressing their vote intention publicly, but they actually cast their ballots for Trump on election day. The study to show that about 93 or 94% of the Republican supporters voted for Trump on election day. But they got some kind of time, the lapse or gap uh, uh, between their vote intention and their actual their vote choice. So, I think that we are witnessing another shy Trump situation on the opposite side, the Democratic side, uh, called Hidden Harris in 2024, this year. As you know, Harris unexpectedly became the Democratic Party's presidential nominee after Biden dropped out of the race. Then the Democratic Party supporters uh, did, not have, did not have enough information and confidence about her. But uh, most of the Democratic Party supporters uh, decided to support her, but still there are some supporters needed, needed more time before they make up their minds. So I think that this year, Republican Party supporters completed, uh, finished their support for Trump earlier, earlier than Harris, uh, the supporters. 
So we saw that Trump got a surge in the polls about two weeks ago, while Harris needed a, a little bit more time before her party supporters complete or finish their support uh, for Harris. So personally, I think that we have more hidden Harris than shy Trump this year. So key factor for this election is whether hidden Harris supporters would actually come out to vote on election day. That will make a huge difference. Right. So mm. hidden Harris supporters could be a key factor in mm. deciding the winner of the elections. Now, uh, Professor, among many issues that could be factors that could influence the elections. The economy, excuse me, is a major mm. uh, talking point at this time. Considering the economic climate uh, at this time around, uh, which candidate do you believe has an advantage considering the current situation, economic situation? For economy, still Trump, I think. Um, the public opinion polls show that voters perceive that Trump would be better in handling economy and immigration, while Harris would be better in dealing with the abortion and democracy. Uh, as you know, during this uh, presidential campaign, Trump highlighted uh, the Biden government's policy failures, such as high inflation and cost of living and the southern border crisis. And he argued that um, he would be better in dealing with those issues based on what he did uh, when he was in the White House. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Harris emphasized that she would be different from President Biden, and that she proposed for the economy, the opportunity economy, to strengthen the middle class. She also argued that she would be tougher to resolve the southern border crisis. In terms of the, uh, the Harris, the, uh, the, uh, the active campaign, um, the voters' perception about who would be better in dealing with the economy, the gap between the two candidates, I think, uh, uh, has been the smaller uh, toward the election day, election day. But still, I think the Trump got yeah, some advantage in terms of the issue of the economy than Harris. Right, so the gap has been narrowed mm. down as the election um, came forward. Now, um, yes, Professor, I'm afraid we will have to leave our discussion here. We are we're running out of time. We have more questions prepared for you. <laughs> uh, we will have to call you again. Professor, thank you so much for your insights tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Within the Frame. Be sure to tune in next time again as you continue to explore the stories that matter. Until then, stay informed and engaged.